Good morning and welcome to this gathering of the of folks at the Reformed Church Center to talk about the last part of the Vision 2020 report, Forward with Grace. We are an intimate group, at least so far, but um, we do represent, let's see, still, yep, about four, four out of the seven regional synods, and that's a good, that's a good thing. Um, we're so pleased you can all be here with us this morning. As with the other discussions about the Vision 2020 report, we don't um, try to say anything is necessarily good or bad. We say these are the things that are going, that would be different if we do what this report says. And sometimes we might say, and this is how it's going to be a little challenging um, for us to, to be different if we do it. So just keep that in mind as we go through this, through this discussion today. Uh, we will begin with presentations by our three speakers today, and then we will open up the floor for more general discussion. Our, th our three speakers include Linda Berlew Gold, who is pastor now of the Fonda Reformed Church in Fonda, New York. After serving as pastor of First Reformed Church of College Point in Queens, New York, for so many years that she must have started when she was in kindergarten. I definitely remember that she was still in preschool when she was taking RCA history and worship because otherwise she wouldn't be old enough to have done that. She has also served as stated clerk of the Queen's Classes, which she did for five years, and she is currently a member of the RCA Commission on Church Order, and so she'll be speaking about these things from that order's perspective. Not that that's the only way she thinks about things, but that was her assignment today. Michael Edwards is an ordained minister in the RCA um, and has been pa senior pastor of DeWitt Reformed Church, um, where I think he still is currently, and he is also serving as the interim executive minister for the Regional Synod of New York. So he'll be talking about how all of this stuff can be impacting regional synods. And last but certainly not least, Brian Keepers is the lead pastor of Trinity Reformed Church in Orange City, Iowa. Um, he has been an ordained minister in the RCA for 20 years, has two daughters and a brand new granddaughter. So that's really cool. Um, and he has been on the 2020 vision team that prepared the report. And so he'll be speaking to us about um, the report and from the perspective of, you know, this is why we did what we did kinds of things. So each of them will present in that order and then um, we'll be opening up the floor to everybody. And we will begin with Linda Berlew Gold. Good, good morning. So my assignment for this was to look at some of the challenges and the things that are in the order already as far as churches that that might wish at the end of this process to to um, no longer be part of the RCA and want to transfer to other places uh, for uh, whatever reason on their feelings on the report and the issues at hand. And so what I thought might be helpful is to actually go through some of the places there because there is already a process for transferring a church to another denomination and kind of seeing where the, the strengths, where there might need to be some small tweaks and where it might just take a little work. And when we talk about grace, where there might need to be uh, amounts of grace given and, and where those places for discernment would be both for the church and for the classes and for the denomination moving forward. So the first thing to know is in the BCO right now, there is no provision for setting a church free to be non-denominational. There is a provision to transfer it to another denomination. And part of that is you have to have a letter from the other denomination that they feel that the church could do ministry with them in the service of the kingdom of God. So all of what is in there right now is uh, predicated on the fact that there is another receiving established denomination. So one of the challenges may be going forward if there are churches that just either do not want to go to another denomination or defining what is eligible for a classes to transfer someone to. 
um, something short, you know, what qualifies as a denomination, I guess. And that's way above church orders pay grade right now. That will probably go to 2020 if they want to tackle it or the classes will have to figure that out. But that is one place to consider that that currently now many classes have used this process to just kind of have a church be non-denominational on its own. And that's the classes choice. But but just if you're strictly looking at what is in the book, there is not a place short of transferring it to another established denomination. So, so that's the first place where there is some tension and some things that might need to be considered and some discernment that would have to happen as, as to what would be best. Um, and you go through the process and the, and the first couple are pretty easy. The consistory takes a vote and that's a majority vote. And then in that petition goes to classes and the classes appoints a committee. And here comes the second place where there's some discernment. That committee then goes and talks to the congregation. And a vote is taken of the congregation. And as it stands in the BCO right now, there is no number requirement for that vote. There is no, if you get 51% of the congregation, the classes lets the church transfer out. It's very similar to when you're calling a minister. There's not a number that's required. It's a way of discerning the will of the congregation where the congregation stands on the request to transfer. So that is where some of the, the tension is going to come in because when we talk about giving grace and, and hearing everybody's will, when you get, when only say a majority gets grace, what about the other people in the church? What, what, how, at what point do you say, okay, this is definitely a church that would do better transferred to another denomination? Is it 5149? Is it 7525? Is it two thirds? And then what happens? What about the other group? At what point does it now cease to become uh, fair and equitable? And that is some of the stuff that they, that there are requests to, to try to do some changes in language or firming that up. But right now that's a discernment issue of the classes. And that's why, you know, sometimes classes can decide no, but that is the discernment of the classes based on that vote. There's not currently a percentage that is required. Um, and, and the third thing in that discernment, what is what it says in the BCO is, your discernment, and here's where, you know, it may seem less order. We would like to have a strict number. That would make it so, so, so much easier. But what our order calls for is the classes has to discern what's in the best interest of Christ's kingdom in the church. And that's not as easy as saying two-thirds, 75%, 51%. There, there needs to be some discernment of grace. So that's where we kind of step away from. We would like to make everything really neat and clean and easy and disorder people. That would make it really, really simple. But it can get really, really complicated when you're trying to figure out what is the best interest of Christ's kingdom in a place, in a classis, in a church. Um, there was also, um, there, there is a lot of the question that comes in of a church is leaving is about churches being able to take their buildings, being able to take their properties, being able to take whatever their stuff is. And um, the BCL right now allows a classist to do that. A classist can let a church take their things as it stands right now. There's no requirement that, that the classes hold back everything. Um, that is, once again, part of the discernment. If the classist discerns that they would like to have plans for the ministry, right now, that's how it stands. Um, but uh, there was a recent uh, church order paper I forget, I guess it was two years ago now that I had two general synods about this, where they wanted uh, church order to create language to require the classes to allow a church to take the building. And instead they got a paper saying, that's not who we are as a denomination. Um, 
that that the, that that is a classist discernment as the local ministry would be rather than something that would be in the BCO and required. Um, and that could change, but just that was paper a couple of years ago. And the other thing to consider in all of these decisions is there is always the possibility for the church in question to complain to the regional synod if they feel they're not treated fairly, if they feel that the best interest of Christ's kingdom was not served, if they feel the classes did something wrong, if they think the classes is being greedy, they can complain to the regional synod who can review everything. And then that can be appealed to the general synod. And that provision is actually explicitly stated in the section on churches transferring to other denominations. And of course, it's any decision of a classist that would be an option at all. But it is a specific option there to if a church feels that it is not being treated fairly in this process or or the best interest of the church are not being served, they, they do have that option of complaint. So, um, Yeah, basically, that, that's where it stands as far as the order. The, the order to transfer church is pretty straightforward, and it's, it's fairly filled with grace and discernment at this point. So what I think is desired is more concreteness, and that may be something General Synod decides they want, um, but that's going to have to be the decision to make if that, that would be helpful. That's the report from order. Thank you, Linda. Michael Edwards, can you talk about how you think these things might impact? Well, thank you for the invitation. Um, I must say the report uh, will have an impact, but not uh, impact as far as um, um, major transfers and closure in the city of New York. Um, there have been many conversations and at classes level and regional Senate regarding Vision 2020. It has also been our hope that Vision 2020 really dealt with the issue of, of the homosexual uh, position uh, rather than bringing up options for restructuring uh, the life of the church. But we see, um, and I, I'm thankful that our pre my predecessor and worked on eight years ago, how we can be more inclusive and more supportive to classes and congregations who been dealing with this issue uh, at the local level. And the issue of homosexuality became a real serious problem with um, our classes, especially the classes of New York. We received more than hundreds of hatred letters and uh, threatening letters and so forth because of the action we had taken. But at the same time, there was no spirit of grace and no spirit of understanding that we are all sinners saved by grace. But the joy is that um, the Regional Senate of New York has worked out a vehicle whereby churches can go and be united with other denominations and still remain RCA. And many of you know the Reform Association was established for that purpose. And many of our churches that are saying they would like to leave the Reformed Church in America and go to other denominations. We're not hearing that so much in the Synod of New York. What we are hearing, we would like to be an independent church. We would like um, not to be under the supervision of a polity, under a church book of order, being supervised by a classes. And so there are mixed situations that come and uh, cause many questions as far as Vision 2020. 
how do we see mission being inclusive with the life as we return to a wholesome understanding of transformation. The second has to do with um, how do we continue and connect with our seminaries, college and other mission opportunities in the life of the church and how we can be supportive to those areas and how can we see ourselves um, belonging to a tradition, but also to a biblical foundation that we as children of God can seek reconciliation and work within our new structure, our new world. Um, COVID has given us a different look at life and the meaning of the church and the mission of the church. And so Vision 2020 needs to really see where God is placing the church and doing ministry. Our world is hurting, our world is broken. How do we bring the word of God, a word of hope? And many of our churches are looking and saying, we are here to do ministry. We are here to encourage. We are here to lift up the poor. We are here to bring educational foundation of Christian love. How do we spread the love? And so the Synod is here to work with churches to continue its ministry and mission in the bounds of New York and as well as to extend itself to the Reformed Church in America. And we are here to build God's kingdom, not to destroy. Okay, thank you, Michael. Wow. This hardly ever happens at a Reformed Church Center program that the presenters all want less time. You, you, were, you, were, all watching, you were all watching the impeachment trial this past week where everybody kept giving, giving their time back because nobody wanted to be there, I guess. But um, we'll, so this is good, we're moving along. Brian Keepers, it's good to have you here with us as well. Brian was on the 2020 team. Um, and so he can talk a little about that perspective. Thanks, James. Uh, and it's really good to get to be with all of you this morning. I don't know what the temperatures are like for you, but it is freezing here in Iowa. And uh, we've got negative 10, negative 20 by tomorrow. So uh, hopefully it's a little bit warmer where you are, or at least you're, you're warm inside. Um, yeah, it's, it's, really, it's really great to get to be here and to be a part of this conversation today. Um, my assumption is that you have had a chance to read the report. And in the, in the time that I have, I'm, I'm not so much going to uh, just review that. Uh, I would encourage you if you haven't, if you want more details to go and, and actually read the report and you can, um, you, know, you, can, you can see some of the more specifics. Um, I guess I would want to just remind, um, remind us that the, the task that was given to the Vision 2020 team uh, re was really to consider three scenarios and the implications of those scenarios. Uh, staying together, uh, second option of a radical restructure and reorganization, or what we were calling at the time a grace-filled separation. Uh, so I know that Michael mentioned that, that, that some of his hopes and maybe the hopes of others was that our team would have resolved some of the tension around human sexuality. And I fully understand that. I think a lot of others had that hope, uh, but that really wasn't our mandate. Uh, and, and so um, that just wasn't what our team was designed to do. We know that that, that impacts the work that we're doing, but, but our mandate really was to look at these three scenarios, to work through the full implications, the impact on the denomination as a whole, and to try to uh, offer our best work in terms of a way forward. So I wanna talk a little bit then about the, the moving forward with grace. This is the third recommendation. And, uh, and, and I wanna begin by um, just responding to the question, why this recommendation? And you'll notice in the report that with the other two, uh, we actually have them at this point 
they, they've been written uh, as a recommendation that, that would be ready to go to General Synod. Um, this one, you'll notice that there wasn't an actual recommendation written uh, because we're still working on that. And we're really grateful to be working with the Commission on Church Order and Linda and, and, and her, um, her team has just been incredibly helpful to us in this. But, but why, why this third recommendation that we are calling um, mutual, uh, mutual generosity in terms of um, a separation? And really from the beginning of our process, there were churches that indicated that they would be leaving the RCA regardless of the outcome. Uh, some who had been quite a ways down the road in terms of that. Uh, there were others who indicated that they were going to wait and see uh, what the final recommendation of the Vision 2020 team would be. And then that would depend on whether they, they stayed or, or they left the RCA. We really have tried uh, as a team to acknowledge that, that loss is going to be inevitable no matter what our team's final report was. Uh, and, and so the team wondered about um, offering a clear and consistent pathway for churches who, for whatever reason, decide that they, that they needed to leave the RCA. Uh, we also hoped that this pathway would avoid some of the ugly disputes and legal battles uh, that we've seen embroiling so many other denominations uh, who, who've been threatened by division, particularly tension over human sexuality. So while it grieves us, and I think that's important to say, it, it grieves us to see churches leave uh, and some would argue that this is counter to Jesus' prayer for unity. Uh, our team wanted to try to imagine a way for separation to happen uh, that looked more like Paul and Barnabas, uh, a mutual parting of ways over what felt like ir uh, irreconcilable differences. And so our question was, could we do this in a way that exhibited grace as much as possible and, and really uh, demonstrated the fruit of the spirit? And that really is the spirit behind uh, recommendation number three. It's, it's the spirit of mutual generosity. Uh, like I said earlier, we had started off calling this grace-filled separation, uh, but our team really wrestled with that, and others uh, gave feedback saying, you know, just wondering, is, is there grace in separation uh, when the body seems to be divided? Uh, can we really call that being filled with grace? And, and you know, we can have a debate around that, uh, but we decided that a better way to talk about this was was thinking in terms of mutual generosity. And by this, we mean, uh, is there a way for churches to leave in which the classes would be generous towards the local church, allowing them to keep their building and their assets? And Linda said that, that that's already within the prerogative of, of a classes in the BCO. It's not required. And I, and I think what we are really asking is that this would be something that would be um, really the norm is what we're asking of classes. And in return, that churches would be gener generous towards the classes and the denomination uh, by agreeing to pay two years of assessments, just recognizing that that has impact on the rest of the denomination. Um, in terms of, so that's really the spirit. And, I, and again, I want to emphasize that is that we're really kind of aiming for this spirit of generosity. That's the guiding principle. In terms of the letter of the recommendation, again, the specific details have been more challenging, as Linda said. Uh, but we, we are continuing to work with the Commission on Church Order, seeking their input, wisdom, uh, and guidance along the way. Our goal uh, on the advice of the CCO, and I don't know if this will be able to happen or not, but we're, we're trying to find a way uh, with this recommendation to avoid making any proposed changes to the BCO, if possible. Uh, we believe that this has a better chance of passing at General Synod, and, and it can more quickly be implemented if it offers guiding principles and, and really works within the current BCO, recognizing, again, as Linda has said, that the authority ultimately lies with the classes. I think the last thing that I wanna say in terms of my presentation today um, is that we, we have really, it's, it's been a core value for our team to do our work in front of the denomination, engaging the denomination uh, along the way rather than just kind of going off somewhere and two years later, or now it's three years, uh, coming and saying, okay, here's, here's the work that we've done, give us the thumbs up or the thumbs down. Uh, so we've wanted to seek feedback along the way. Transparency has been a, a, a strong value for our team. And so I'd, I'd love to just be able to share with you where we've gained more clarity with the final report since it was released last summer. 
And as we've engaged class C's and regional synods, we've done a number of gatherings uh, in which people have been able to offer feedback. And here's, here's a couple things, again, in full transparency that, that we have learned and that we're working on. Uh, one is that we realized that the letter of intent language, which was in the final report, that, that, that that's been confusing. Uh, it was really designed for churches who had tried to follow the BCO's uh, petition to withdraw, uh, but were denied this by their classes, uh, or who felt like they were, you know, quote, being held hostage, unquote, by their classes. And so this was designed where a church could submit a letter of intent, and uh, if, 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 if they were denied the withdrawal, uh, the petition to withdraw by the classes, and then the two-year clock would start uh, ticking at that point in terms of their assessments. Uh, so we've really tried to clarify this. Um, in fact, in the report itself, there's a little link that, that will take you, you can, you can click on it under the third recommendation and it will take you uh, to a letter that we put out since then that, that tries to clarify that, saying to churches that if you are at a place where you, you know that you, you, you want to leave, follow the, the BCO. Uh, we think that that's the easiest way to do that. Um, the letter of intent, some, some have offered that more as an act of courtesy just to let the classes know that they're planning to do that. But we, we really are urging churches, if they must, if they feel they must leave, follow the BCO process. And, and again, that letter of intent is if for some reason that's denied. The, the other thing that we've realized since the report, uh, final report was released is that we, we, we used retroactive language uh, in that recommendation and, and that that's problematic. Um, our intent with it was, was to respond to churches who, who really were threatening to leave immediately. And it sounds like maybe, you know, listening to Michael, that hasn't so much been the case in, in, in his region, but there are other regions of the RCA uh, where, where churches were ready to leave uh, and really there wasn't, um, there wasn't kind of any intent to offer, uh, I mean, their classes were just gonna let them go without, without any kind of generosity. And uh, so we, we wanted to engage them in such a way to say, hey, again, this, this impacts the entire denomination. Uh, we're really aiming for the spirit of mutual generosity. Um, so, you know, if they didn't want to wait for this to pass and then thinking, okay, is there gonna be some kind of ratification process that will have to happen after that? We were saying, you know, would you be willing if we could start the clock now and do something retroactively uh, would, you, would you be willing to con continue to stay and, and really comply with this two years of assessments? Um, you know, we, again, we just realized that, that that's complicated. Um, I think that there have been some feedback even from the CCO saying, is, is this, can, can we even do that? Can we even do something retroactive like this that hasn't been approved yet by General Synod? And so the clarification that we're making at this point, and this is gonna be released um, more, more widely in the in coming weeks is that we're really saying, um, let's adjust that to ask churches to, to commit to at least one year of, um, of assessments once the recommendation has been approved at General Synod, whenever General Synod happens. Um, so the clock will start in the quarter. Uh, we're we're going to divide it up into four quarters uh, in terms of, of, of uh, when they could submit their petition within a year. And uh, the clerk will start at whatever point they submit that uh, for, a, for a full year. And they can they could go beyond that, but we're, we're asking that they would commit to at least one year. Again, we recognize that the classist does have the final say over this. Um, so we're, we're just trying to kind of give a path, uh, really kind of saying, is, is there a way that we can, as much as possible, be consistent across the denomination on this? Let me, let me just close by, making a couple other comments here. Um, again, I, I guess I wanna acknowledge on behalf of our team that, that there, there is grief in the fact that, that this needs to be one of our key recommendations for the RCA. Uh, there is loss in all of this. And we've, we have believed that our role as the Vision 2020 team is to help the denomination face the reality of loss and also to um, be intentional about uh, helping the denomination lament. And we think that this work of lament is gonna be an important part moving forward. Uh, we also believe that in a fallen world, there are times when individuals 
churches and even denominations must part ways because of what feels like irreconcilable differences or misalignment with theological convictions, values, and mission. Um, we talked a lot about Christian unity uh, and, and thinking theologically about that as a team. And, and we believe that it's, it's, unity is a multi-layered and nuanced um, thing. And, and that the kingdom of God uh, is bigger than any single church or denomination. So if a parting must happen, if there is some kind of separation that needs to happen, our hope as a team is that we could do it with God's grace in such a way that we can seek to love one another well, and that even in our separating, that somehow we might maintain a gospel witness in the world. That's really the heart behind the report. It's the heart behind this recommendation. And I'll close there. Thank you, Brian. Um, as I before I open up the floor, I just wanted to say briefly. I what I remember from my polity classes, and I will admit that I took polity back when the BCO was still written on the original papyrus in John Henry Livingston's hand with David Demarest's corrections in the margins. Um, but what I remember is that the reason that the BCO doesn't allow us to transfer a congregation to independency is because reformed polity doesn't, doesn't even conceive of the idea that the church can exist with congregations all off completely by themselves with nobody with them. We, we, we understand the church as congregations in community with one another, what we usually call denominations um, in America. And so we just don't see that the same way. Um, that being said, Jim Reed is up and I'm going to invite him to unmute and say his piece. Jim, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, what I would like to comment about is I think that the Vision 2020 report, which uh, in all the scenarios that have been shared uh, with the church uh, about General Synod coming together again, when and how, the, the Vision 2020 report is the prominent agenda piece that is mentioned. Uh, I would suggest that the Vision 2020 report uh, be tabled, that uh, we have a whole bunch of other more urgent priorities, survival priorities, that have been thrust upon us by COVID-19. Uh, we have not been able to sit down and have true in-depth dialogue as congregations as churches, as classes, or as synod, uh, because we're, we're stuck with what we're doing right now, uh, Zoom, uh, which you, you understand the limitations of this type of communication when it comes to complex issues. Uh, there needs to be a back and forth, uh, and there needs to be a lot of it. Uh, this I don't see an opportunity for the adequate discussion of what you have presented in that report as options and next steps. I think what we need to do is to assess where is the church now in the midst of this upside down, inside out situation that COVID has thrust us into. Uh, we have churches that haven't had corporate worship in almost a year, who haven't celebrated the sacraments in, in that amount of time, who haven't commemorated marriage, who, some who haven't even buried their dead. Uh, and now we're going to take on this complex issue of coming apart and who owns what property and what is, uh, what is uh, necessary. Uh, I don't see that we have the platform to do that without first going back, uh, understanding that Vision 2020 was based upon what the situation was of our churches in 2018, 2019 and before, 
but not the situation that we face in 2021 and reassess what are not only the challenges, but what are the opportunities that COVID now presents to our local churches. We've seen an entire culture move from the national type level thinking into a renewed emphasis upon locality. And yet within the 2020 report, uh, locality seems to be eh, second, third, fourth, fifth priority. Uh, there's an opportunity there for a denomination that has a church in Podunk and West Podunk and North Podunk. Uh, I live in a small community and I know that I experience every day a, a renewed emphasis in what that communal life is. And I would like to see us expend our energy on developing that opportunity which presents itself before every single congregation in every part of this denomination. I don't think we can do that while we're fiddling with the machinery of the denominational structure uh, or trying to, to come up with fine points about who owns what and how it can be transferred. We actually need the dialogue of the entire diverse and sometimes antagonistic views, theological and ecclesiastical that we have within our situation, our church, our denomination now. So I would like to see this thing tabled and us go back and take a, a I realize uh, it's a, um, uh, a situation that doesn't generate a lot of enthusiasm to go back and do basic research again, but I think it's very, very necessary. I don't know whether you can discern a question out of all that, uh, but that that's what I have to say. Panelists, anybody want to try to make a response to that? Remember, you have to unmute yourself. I can just say for church order, if you've seen any of our work as far as the options for general synod, pretty much we have said, even if we can figure out how to do something virtual or multi-site or anything like that, that this would be a really bad idea to try to tackle this right now. Um, that that it would be, you know, ideal to wait on this until we can have an in-person general synod, uh, just for various reasons. That's not necessarily an order decision, other than the fact that you know, the rules kind of do say if you're not used to doing. Uh, virtual meetings that you shouldn't do anything substantive. And I can't imagine much more substantive than this uh, to be done, so. And, and thanks, James, because um, pastors and consistories are really dealing with how do we survive in this COVID? How do we pay our bills? How do we uh, pay the pastors? How do we maintain the property? And so there are so many issues that uh, churches are wrestling with and how do we continue to do mission in our communities that are hurting? How do we provide for many who are unemployed and those who have issues dealing with hunger and income support? And so the churches, pastors are really wrestling with consistories, not so much a vision 2020. They're saying, how can we help someone and be effective in our churches. Yeah, I really, I, I appreciate James. Um, I appreciate what you're saying and, and what Linda and Michael just said. Um, I think this speaks to the complexity of just where we're at in different places in the denomination. I think that there are some of us who are saying now is not the time to do this. There, I mean, there, we're in the midst of a pandemic. There are so many other things that have higher priority. What's also true though, is that there are other places in the RCA um, where they are talking about this and, and have been talking about it and to table this and to not, to not address this in some way, whenever we meet in person, I would agree with Linda. I think it needs to be in person. Um, they're, they're not willing to wait. I think of my own classes. Uh, it, 
East and West Sioux classes in Northwest Iowa, Dakota classes, we've heard it from Canada, I think over on the West Coast of, of saying, hey, we're, and, and we're working with our classes, a, a whole classes, an entire classes can't leave, right? I mean, that's, there's no provision for that in the BCO, but there is a way for them separately together to all leave and, and to do so in such a way that says, we're, we're really, um, you know, we're, we're taking our, our assets uh, and we're, we're not gonna, you know, act in any way that's generous to, towards the RCA. Now, I think, I think most of the churches that we're talking to want, I think, want to do that. I think they want to work with this process. And I think they want to think about the impact that it has on the entire denomination. Um, but I, I, think, I think it just speaks to the complexity. People are at all different places in terms of the level of urgency around this. Just, just a thought from your thoughts. Um, the urgency factor of people leaving seems to me to be, uh, it's a felt fact on their part, but what does this say about some more basic notions? What does it mean to have given a gift to an institution, to a not-for-profit institution? Um, the resources that are controlled by classes and by the congregations in lieu of the classes and by the classes in lieu of the entire denomination are, are assets that are built upon gifts that have been given. Gifts of, of monetary, gifts of property, gifts of time, effort, and devotion. If we say, well, you know, I, I really don't like the idea that Michael and his husband are gonna sit in the pew third from the back uh, and I have difficulty with that. And so I'm leaving and I'm taking the pew with me. Uh, what does that say about what the intention was of giving those gifts in the first place? Uh, you try to, to break it down into uh, two years of assessment as a ransom. I don't know what else to call it. And that, that is not translatable so directly and so simply. What I fear is that th any one of the other churches in the denomination who do not withdraw on that basis can go to court, secular court. And they can say, wait a minute, this is a not-for-profit religious institution and there are rules. And the rules are that when you give a gift, it's not an investment, it's a gift. You, you give all the control of it, that resource, whatever that is. And this, each congregation, for example, has uh, built on uh, the good name of the Reformed Church in America in order to come into its existence and to appeal to the public. What is that worth? Uh, we're gonna certainly have different answers on that. Why are people not uh, willing to, to leave now? No one's holding them back. You know, uh, Thousands of former RCA members over the past 30 years have exercised that option to leave for a whole variety of reasons. So it's a, it's a live option, it's an immediate option. But no, there, there is this attraction for taking the assets with you. And that then throws us into a whole political ball game I don't think we have currently the energy or the opportunity uh, to, to get into that type of political battle. 
I think we're much more where Michael has indicated, uh, we're in survival mode. And that survival mode has to do not simply with our finances, it has to do with the way that we operate on every congregational basis. And we need the wisdom of those who would otherwise get up and leave because they also are experiencing this same type of COVID related pressure. We're in this together. God has put us into this together. And we need to have some very serious basic dialogue an exchange of ideas, almost uh, infinitum, ongoing, in order to, to get ourselves out of this. We need each other right now. Uh, therefore, I don't wanna consider avenues of, of exit. I wanna make an appeal to, to the diverse theological and ecclesiastical views of the RCA. And my God, is there another denomination that hasn't had such a diversity of theological and, and ecclesiastical views over 400 years? This isn't our first crisis. I would, I would just appeal that uh, we, we refocus, we put our focus elsewhere. And we put our focus on, again, not just the crises, but the opportunities. What is God saying to us by this change that has wrought not only uh, church life, but our community life as well? How do we serve God's purpose in that changed circumstance? End of speech. Uh, I don't need to do a sermon on Sunday now. Right? I'm going to invite Sharon Atkins to go ahead and um, unmute and ask what you'd like to ask, Sharon. Good morning, everyone. Grace and peace to you all. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I just wanted to um, comment on the previous speaker in terms of, um, first and foremost, giving thanks to the 2020 vision team for the work that you've done at such a difficult time and also um, for the strength that God has given you to look at all different areas in this and even your willingness to go back and to see what else can come out of this piece. And for that, Brian, I thank you and your other participants. I think I am at the point, um, a New York child raised in the city church in the city, ministering in the city. One of the things that um, comes to light is part of what my brother was saying earlier. The Reformed Church is focused this time on dividing and leaving and all those things. But when for your average everyday congregant, the care right now is survival. And not just in the survival individually, you know, getting up and, you know, maybe not having a job, maybe dealing with children who are home from school when that wasn't part of your role as a substitute teacher while you're trying to hold your full time job or not have a job and seek for a job, but also the community that you found strength in collectively in terms of physical connection on Sunday mornings is no more. The mental health of our society is in a very severe place right now. And when we look at that, I look at all of this and COVID and all of this and people, some people feel, what is God doing to us? I say, God is all up in this because we as a church are being challenged. First with the question, whose church are we? Because we no longer have the opportunity to be in the buildings. So our Father God is asking us, what are we doing? How are we extending the tides outside of our doors? 
how are we taking care of the people who took care of us with their tithes and offerings for so long in this time of need? How are we making a difference in a time when the doors are shut, but the spirit of God doesn't live in the doors? The spirit of God doesn't live in the building. The spirit of God lives in each and every one of us. And how are we going to make that connection at this difficult time? And so when you come out and you hear that the church of Jesus Christ is right now, the biggest thing on our mind is whether we should stay together, divide, split, get independent, do whatever. When you come to that place, folks begin to question their Christian faith. Because right now I'm trying to survive like, Dr. Edwards said, right now I'm trying to hold on. And this is what you want me to put at the forefront. This is what you want me to put into a place that you find this as the biggest thing going. This can't wait another two years. And even for those churches who want to leave, is it that important that you leave now in the midst of everything that's going on? in the midst of what's going on in our country overall, I, I just feel that, I just feel our priorities as Christians, as pastors, as leaders, as members are skewed if this is what we call the most important thing that's going on right now. We have a vaccine, yes, but we still have thousands of people that are getting sick and dying every day. Where are we holding our allegiance to God on this? Is it that important that our church leave or our church stay? Is it that important that we hold tight to denomination? Right now, I believe that the most important thing we need to hold tight to is God. And then ask the Lord, Lord, what do you want us to do for you during this time? You've blessed us for hundreds of years. You've kept the denomination for hundreds of years. Yes, like everything else, we are going through transition and change. But Lord, in the midst of this, what do you want us to do for you right now? Not what we, we want to do for us, but what do you want us to do for you? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sharon. Panelists, do you, wasn't really a question put to you, so. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to invite Liz Testa to go ahead and unmute and ask her question. Good morning, everyone. And um, I just want to say thank you to uh, my sister in the classes of New York, Reverend Sharon Atkins, for her compelling reflection. Uh, friends, my, my question to you, and let me say, I hold a role uh, on denominational staff, but this morning I am really with you in my capacity as the president of New York classes. So it's it's in that spirit that I would would love to know if, um, and I believe our our my colleagues in the classes of New York at least are wondering also if there have any. I know it might be premature, but have there been any discussions about how developing a plan? Um, about developing a plan in the event that we cannot meet properly until 2022, given you know that virtual is not really optimal and that in-person is not possible. Um, and also understanding as, as Reverend Keepers has noted for us that there are congregations in other areas um, of the denomination that are seeking to leave for, for whatever their reasons are um, in advance of when the body might make their decisions. Have you all, has there, have there been thoughts about that type of planning? And does, does that make sense? Let, let, me, let me say a little bit more about what I'm trying to say, that I understand that we're still trying to stay the course with the scenarios that are laid before us and with trying to be able to meet. But if we are not able to meet in a way that the entire body can, can gain consensus around and that's legally feasible and constitutionally feasible, have there been other plans any other conversations around how to frame, how to plan for congregations opting to leave and us not being able to get together as a body to make these decisions properly together in community? Linda? I, yeah, I can just kind of say, I mean, church order, um, we've been working with Vision 2020 on some language and some guidelines and some 
I don't want to call them rules, but guidelines to be approved with the idea that they will go in the 20, you know, as the 2020 team likes them, with the idea that they would go before the body, something short of BCO changes, um, but that we would covenant to agree to. And we've done a lot of work on them. And what we were discussing is like, what if this never gets ever gets to get voted on? And what we figured was the work that we're doing could be released as kind of guidelines, non-binding to the classes, but to help help give them the points, like I kind of laid out, where you need to discern, where you need to think. And and I'm not sure whether that document would come from us or 2020 or both together. But my hope would be is that those of us who have been working on these things, short of it becoming legal order items, that there still could be some of this work could be released as guidance to the classes in the meantime. Like these are the things you need to consider. This is where maybe your your mind should be. Um, unfortunately, there's no way to pass anything binding until we actually have a general synod. Um, but I, I think that if it does wind up that it's going to be another year and classes are looking for guidelines, I, I think there's the opportunity for for putting some guidelines out to to help classes because I, I think it is going to be rough for classes to have to make these discernments kind of on the fly on their own without some idea of what else is going on. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Linda. And um, I would also point out to everybody something that Brian said, you know, they've been they were trying to come up with a plan that did not require BCO changes, which means that everything that the 2020 team suggested is legally possible to do now, which means the classes can go ahead and do that if they if somebody really need really can't wait and really needs to do it. We don't need the General Synod to make that particular decision. Lynn Japinga, I invite you to unmute. OK. Um, so you you have seen this probably in chat, but you know, Brian, you spoke about wondering or, or saying that you were trying to recognize that everybody was going to lose something. And, and I understand that. Um, my concern is that it seems to me that the people who are leaving ought to bear the brunt of the law of the loss. If, if you don't want to be a part of the RCA, that's your choice, but we don't need to pay you to leave. And so it's striking me that these discussions about the mission budget are, are a way to pay people to leave. And I, I just don't think that's remotely appropriate um, that a, a number of the people who want to leave, in my understanding, ha, are, have come late to the RCA. Uh, they're not very committed to our theology or polity or history. And they came in maybe because of getting money from church extension or something. And, and again, that doesn't apply to everybody, but that's certainly some. Um, and, and so I'm just, really wondering about this loss business and who, who pays the price of the loss. And I also have a question about, you know, maybe we just need to let people go before they do even more damage. Um, and I, I've got this sense that there are people who wanna reshape the denomination and, and fix everything that's wrong with us, which it would mean breaking everything that we historically have done about polity and theology. And, but then they're still gonna leave. So I'm, I'm just really troubled about giving what people who I would call schismatics basically, and I know that's harsh, but I think that's what's happening. I don't wanna give them any more power than we have to. Yeah, thanks for that, Lynn. Um, and I think, I mean, I, I think that, that some of the churches who are leaving, uh, to your point, um, have come maybe later in the game into the RCA. I, I, don't, I don't think that that's true though across the board. Um, for example, I would think about in, in my own synod, synod of the heartland, um, you know, there's, there's a, a number of churches that have been committed to the RCA, you know, for a long time. 
and I'm not saying that I agree with this. So I just I, I want to be clear about that. But but who are really just saying we 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 can we we just believe we can't stay uh, if there's going to be diversity theological diversity around human sexuality. And that's and that's that's where the focus tends to be. And again, I'm not saying that I agree with that. I feel frustrated about that myself, to be honest with you. Um, but you know, I I think that there are. I, I hear you. I think what we've tried to avoid, you know, the Vision 2020 team had a number of groups all along the way, and most recently the this the Alliance of Reformed Churches. I'm not sure how familiar uh, those of you are in terms of of that's one kind of uh, landing pad that's being worked on right now by some in the denomination who want to leave. We've but we've had a number of groups come and say, can you can you build this into your recommendation? Um, and we've said no. Uh, we've said this. Uh, our our final report really is saying. I mean, and there were even those who said, "Can can you do something like the United Methodist Church, and can we can we somehow split into two denominations?" And uh, what we have said with with the three recommendations together really is that um, for those who feel like they need to leave, we we want to give uh, give a way for that to happen and. Really, it's 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 more of kind of just, I think, uh, continuing to emphasize the process we have in place, and and again, kind of pushing for the spirit of generosity. Um, but but for those who want to continue to stay, you know, this is this is about being a part of kind of continuing to to breathe something new into this denomination that we love. Um, so we really have avoided, you know, trying to kind of come up with easy ways for people to. Just hey, let's you know, let's let's be a part of this group. Um, I guess I just don't know what to do though about the the reality is that there there are churches who are leaving, and and I think it's probably more than we initially uh, expected. And yeah, how, I mean, how how do we do this in a way where we think about the the, the impact that it has on the rest of of our churches? Um, the other thing that I'll say, Lynn, in response to that, and I'd love you can you can you can respond to this, but my sense um, on the Vision 2020 team is that those who wanted to kind of stay and fight for the RCA to become something different than it is, my sense is that they're at a point of saying we're we're ready to just go and kind of do our own thing. Um, that I I am not hearing as much of kind of a, a determination to stay and to try to bring some changes. From within the denomination, um, so I think those who want to stay really are those who appreciate Reformed theology, who appreciate um, our polity, even if maybe there's some things that they'd like to see a little bit different. But that's that's just my sense. Thank you. That's very helpful. Appreciate that, Brian. Okay, Valentina Jones, I hope you I just pronounced your name right. Yes, you did. Yeah. Um, my name is Valentina Jones and I'm a registered nurse and I go to DeWitt Reformed Church. And my question is that I think one of the things with COVID-19 is a clear concept that we need to pivot, reset, do some things a little differently. And I think one of the things that is just to me like crystal clear is that we are all in this together. Uh, your child goes to school with somebody, uh, somebody gets on a plane, somebody takes a train, somebody takes a bus, somebody gets together here, there. We are not isolated, we are not, we are in this together. And so my question is, how are you using what's happening, not only using, but looking at this clearly, because clearly we're in this together. If, if, if we don't understand anything else, I think we all should understand we are in this together. Um, so how are you using that to reset, to pivot at this moment for this issue? This was an issue of a certain time and maybe it's still here. But the issue that we all are faced with right now is the fact that we are in this together. We get well together, we get sick together, we 
we are in this together. So how are you using this? Because I'm not, yeah, how are you using this? Because I think it's just very obvious. And I think that the church, if any, anyone or anybody or any leaders should take the lead, it's the church that should take the lead in terms of pivoting and adjusting and resetting to the environment that we're in, to the fact that we all should be able to see very clearly that we are in this together. What you do impacts me. What your child does impacts another child. What you do at work impacts somebody else. What you do on the train, the bus, the whatever, impacts somebody else. What you do at church impacts somebody else. So how are we using this? That's my question. How are we using this to pivot, to direct, to lead, to say, this is where God is taking us. Maybe he took us someplace else before, but how are we using this today to pivot, to reset? Michael, you're, tra you're training your congregation to preach. Well done. That's why we have students in seminary from DeWitt at New Brunswick and others are seeking to explore other means of being effective in ministry. And that's where we need our seminaries and our schools and our colleges. Okay. Can I, James, can I just say something in response sure. to that? Because I, I, I've really appreciated just some very compelling statements around, you know, we are in this together. And, uh, and I wholeheartedly say amen to that. I think sadly, again, I'm just telling you from what I've seen in terms of working on this team across the denomination, I don't think that that sentiment is shared. And I think that's part of... Um, I think that's part of the loss and, and the sadness for me personally in this. Um, but I, I wish it were so. I wish that there, I wish that there was more of that sense that we're in this together. And I don't, I don't know how to cultivate that more for people. Um, but, but I hear it today and, and, and it inspires me and, and I just, I appreciate it. And I wish, I wish that that were, were true across the board for us as a denomination. Okay, Sheila Moses, I invite you to unmute and um, ask your question or say your piece. Am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Okay, at the risk of sounding completely dumb and ignorant, if I remember correctly, and I, I don't remember what was the year that we decided that the vision 2020 would come back with recommendations for the general synod to decide. And they came back with three options, which were unfortunately when we were to vote on it was curtailed by, by COVID as everything else has been curtailed by COVID. Now, recognizing that there may be that that, that, that there may be groups that, um, for whatever reasons, um, are anxious to leave, I think there is um, the Book of Church Order ha has um, directives for how we go about that. So, if 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 we have this 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 these recommendations that have been stalled by COVID. And we can continue to, to say that un, until we meet together, until we were able to meet in person, that cannot be addressed. What precludes the, 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 the process of the way that the, the standard way of leaving? Is it because if we sort of, and, and, and I'm calling it a bum rush, the, 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 the places that want to leave want to do a bum rush. And, and sort of avoid what the standard is and leave with their assets, which they are not entitled to according to the book of church order. I, I don't understand why we can't say, let's set aside this 
the, the, the decisions because we have not voted. This was something that we were suppo supposed to vote on. We had three options and we were supposed to vote on it. We have not been able to do so. Because of COVID, we, it's naturally on pause. The other churches that want to leave should be able to leave according to whatever the standard of the, and the book of church order is at this time. Okay. I can just say there is absolutely nothing keeping a church from leaving right now if they want to. I mean, short of going through the process and short of their classes determining that it's not in the best interest of the kingdom of God. There, there is nothing that would keep a church from leaving at this time. There's no sort of freeze. Nothing was put in place. I mean, logistics, if classes aren't meeting, if, you know, those types of things may hold it up. But yeah, the, the, what, what I went through is, is there, and that is still in order until something else is put in place. Now, the, the reality is some churches are waiting because they're hoping something else will be put in place. And, and I don't say that as a plus or a minus, I'm just saying that that is a, a fact. And so that's it. But there is right now nothing that is keeping a church who wants to leave from leaving other than possibly the logistics of their classes not meeting. About 50 years ago, we had the same argument when African-Americans started to uh, become more active and vocal in the RCA and many pastors at General Senate and others at various um, meetings said we will be leaving the Reformed Church. We are not racist. And so you had that argument. Then when uh, the ordination of women, you have many who have said we are leaving the Reformed Church. Um, these become issues rather than structural concerns. And, but how do we become a people who belong? Should be a question that we be prayerful about. And if there's an issue coming up, how many who will say we will be leaving? Rather than saying, how can we work together to enhance the kingdom of God? That's my observation. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Sheila, of course. Um, Stephanie Dusha. And I've known Stephanie for a long time, and I've probably still got her name wrong. <laughs> I am so used to that. It's not a problem. It, it's my married name, so I'm used to kind of explaining that I left an easier name behind, but that's okay. It doesn't look like it's spelled, but my husband's family pronounces it Duskit, so that's what we say, which is fine. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm here um, as a person who loves the RCA, just like all of you. Um, I'm not, I'm a minister of word and sacrament. I'm also on the general synod council, but I'm not speaking as a general synod council member. That's not appropriate and that's not, but it does, I am here because I want to hear what <clears throat> the church in a more broad way is saying and thinking. So thank you for all your participation and uh, certainly to the panel for your helpful presentations. So speaking just for myself, um, even though it has ramifications elsewhere, I am troubled by the fact that when we left General Synod 2019, <clears throat> there was a general agreement. I don't know, <clears throat> I don't remember the wording or anything anymore, but there was a sense that there was supposed to be an agreement that we would not make substantial changes until the Vision 2020 report was completely vetted and voted on and that there was something that would be considered settled, even though I know that's kind of a troublesome word even yet. but. I have not seen that happening. And I think that perhaps that was unrealistic anyway, because anxiety, because of people's motivations and desires. Um, but because that's so, I, I have come to believe more and more that the level of trust in the denomination is further eroded the longer this goes. And so um, what I see is that, and I'm claiming as a person who plans to stay with the RCA 
as it has historically been, should that be how things shake out. Um, I see a lot of other machinations going on and I hear about them. And I'm afraid that while those who want, have wanted to leave for some time have been, have been claiming that they have been held hostage, I believe it's the reverse situation as time has gone on. And that those of us who really do wanna continue with RCA polity and history and theology are being more held hostage by the incessant discussions and machinations that are going on around how in the world can this group leave and be satisfied? I don't think there is an answer that um, leads to that being fully satisfied by every, to everyone's satisfaction. And a part of me just wonders if maybe during this pandemic, I don't believe God sent it. I don't think God sent this upon us to wreak havoc and for so many people to have died. But I think in this intervening time, I agree with some of the other speakers who've said <laughs> the, the imperative to live out the gospel ministry of clothing the naked and feeding the poor, feeding the hungry and taking care of, you know, the, the real gospel imperatives in my mind, those are the things that really need to take our attention. And that might be during this time, maybe it's supposed to be that we see that that is the essence of our ministry and work together on how to do that instead of this constant drumbeat of what about human sexuality? Secondly, um, I'm very troubled by, and I have been from the beginning when it comes to how does the congregation get to the point of deciding that they would want to leave? I'm fully supportive of the fact that the BCO has a provision and that that should be followed. But um, I think we have few resources geared towards helping people within maybe classes, leaders, and others to work with an individual congregation. I sense, and this is, you know, from my isolated place in the St. Louis area, I'm not even near a whole bunch of churches, but I try to stay in touch as much as, much as possible in, in classes. I sense that, you know, that there would be many churches. Oh, and I'll ad admit, I was an advisor. <clears throat> I was uh, one of the advisory people, leading advisory team, I should say, in 2019. And I heard this in my group that there would be people, especially lay people at that point who would say, wow, I didn't know that the denomination was this far down the track. And I didn't even know that these were such big issues. And so I know that um, there are many pastors and other leaders in congregations who really feel that they need to leave the denomination. But I really, really wonder how many people in the pew, how many people who have been active, relatively active members, or maybe not as active, but still consider you know, this congregation, their church home, would they really, really be aware of the ramifications of saying we are going to depart from the RCA? So if a vote comes to 51% wants to leave and 49% want to stay, well then how do we effectively really care for the 49% that Linda referred to? Um, I mean, sure, we can look at what legally, we can say, well, they lost. That's not who we want to be. And I think we are doing a great disservice to many of our RCA members if we don't take that to heart and wonder about this. So I'm just laying the cards on the table for how I see it. And I don't wanna just label some people as, as using their strong wills to get what they want. Although I do see some of that. And I see that that's also exemplified in other aspects of the church too, not just that, that particular point of view. But we do need to be more pastorally inclined towards caring for one another in this really difficult time. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I'm going to call on Lynn Jappinger because she put a question in chat and um, I'm not sure how well it got answered in chat because we're not sure how, how we did with our tech. Um, Linda, I was just curious, you had mentioned briefly, you know, that some people are waiting to see if the RCA would change so that they could stay. And I'm curious, you know, just briefly, if possible, what would that take? what would they need to be able to stay? I, I think I wasn't so much talking about the RCA changing so that they could stay as much as, and I will try to phrase this as uncynically as possible, how the RCA might change so they could get a better deal leaving. Uh, that's kind of what I was referring to, that there is a perception among some churches that 
and and I and I haven't experienced this, so it may be the truth in classes because this decision is classes to classes now that some classes are not letting churches leave or not letting churches leave with their property and that that is um, not what churches want. And so I, I think for some churches, and like I said, I, I don't want to make this sound cynical, but that their hope is if they if they are of the perception that their classes is not letting them leave, that if those rules change at the general synod level, then they will be able to leave with a, a larger percentage of their their assets. Um, OK. That's uh, incredibly troubling, but thank you. It's also <laughs> helpful. So I appreciate that. Thank you. I, I think maybe something. I, this is maybe a different angle. Um, again, I'm and I'm speaking from working with more of some of our conservative churches. I mean, I think that that you know you you hear people say things like maybe the issue is with polity or or things like that. And I I, I happen to believe that it, it it really is this presenting issue of um, of human sexuality and that there is that for some who Let's just take some of these churches again out in the Midwest who are saying we don't necessarily want to leave the RCA, but you know we we think that the RCA the RCA is just getting too 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 liberal, right? That's that we un, unless the RCA takes a clear stand on human sexuality and that everybody gets in line, we can't stay. And I, I'm just finding, I mean, what's been interesting in this whole process is how few people, including pastors and elders, really understand our polity and understand the way that things work as a denomination. Um, I mean, that's become really clear in this, but, you know, I, I, still, I so I think for some, who, what, what would it take, and you may not, I don't know that you're necessarily asking this, Lynn, but I think for some of our conservative churches, what would it take for them to stay? Well, there, that there, would, there would have to be something binding you know, in terms of uh, a traditional view of marriage, uh, and unless that happens, that that they they just believe they can't stay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. As a church historian, I'd like to point out that the first time we have a public record of somebody accusing the RCA of getting too liberal was in the 1690s. <laughs> So we have a long we have a long trail of oh the RCA is getting too liberal which comes up every every so often. I've been hearing it recently more and more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's more conservative. Oh yeah, I'm just yeah, saying. I'm not saying it's not a it's not a new thing. Yes, I, I think one of the things that's that's fascinating to observe is and then how how so much of this has been heightened, you know, uh, I think over the last four years in particular with, with, uh, with the Trump administration, but I think especially this last year, I mean, that's, that's what I see in places where I'm at, where there, there has tended to be a more, um, I, I think maybe a bit more generous kind of conservatism. And you just see more and more people, you know, it's it's are you on this side or that side the, the polarization is just continued to heighten and so I, I think that that's some of the dynamic in terms of the the larger systems where the anxiety is at play in all of this uh, so it's just been interesting to watch as somebody who's pastoring in the midwest and and i think one of the things about covid also is I mean, in one way, we're kind of all in this together, but also we're all in it in our little bubbles where we are. And so we're more and more only getting who we're able to connect with on Zoom. You know, we're no longer, which is one of the reasons why I think there is that, that it would be a really poor idea to do 2020 separate from an entire general synod where you're getting mission reports and you're getting all the good work and everything that's being done in the denomination, but to just siphon out just this piece would, would be hard and that makes it harder to deal with because we're not listening to each other's voices anymore. Um, and we wanna be able to hear each other's voices before we make a kind of a major decision that's gonna 
affect a whole lot of people. Brian, I'm going to invite you to say out loud what you just said in the chat because it went to the panelists, I think. Oh, yeah, I just, I, Liz put something in there about the both and and how there are these narratives among some that the RCA is getting too conservative or held hostage by the, the conservative side and, and others who say, no, it's, it's the liberals are trying to take over and it's held hostage right now by the liberals. And I just find it fascinating that, when we, you know, stories, narrative, the stories we tell ourselves are so strong. And, uh, you know, you, you see, I, I'm always trying to challenge that for people out here when in my neck of the woods where it's the liberals are taking over. And well, let's tell me about that. I mean, what, how have you come to that conclusion? And yet that just creates so much fear that I think really makes it difficult for us to move towards one another um, and, and to be able to engage in healthy dialogue and to engage in, I think some of the, the most important questions that, that, that I've found in this whole process for me is, is how, do we, how do we engage difference together as the body of Christ? Um, I, th I think that's, that's part of the deepest question and um, several of you have already pointed this out. I know I've appreciated Lynn's book uh, too, just that, that, that this is not the first time and it won't be the last time that we have to wrestle through some deep differences. How do we do that? And uh, I think it's, it's been a real, education for me personally to just kind of observe some things these past few years. Well, we've just about come to the end of the time we covenanted to be together, and we don't seem to have anybody um, urgently wanting to add to the discussion. So it seems like a good time at the end of a lovely discussion um, for us to be saying goodbye for now. Obviously, we're still going to have some time to live with and pray with, pray over all of this um, because we're not going to have a general synod, at least not right away and at least not in the normal, the normal way for a little bit um, as we wait to hear what happens with General Synod 2021. Um, I would, again, as a historian, I would remind you all that after the Great Synod of Dort in 1619, the Netherlands did not hold a synod for 200 years. Did not have a synod meeting for 200 years. That was probably a little too long to wait, but it wasn't up to them. It was up to Napoleon. Um, but still, we can, the church survives sometimes without general synods. Um, I hope you all have a good afternoon. I invite you to come back um, on March 2nd. Um, we'll have a short discussion in the middle of the day with our seminary presidents and one of our professors of theology about what it means to certify fitness for ministry. And just exactly a month from now, we'll be on March 13th will be Women's Stories Day and um, Anna Jackson is going to do a presentation titled Like Trees Planted by the Water um, on RCA Black lay women in congregations in the 50s through 70s who took up leadership. And then in April, we will have our Pop and Young presentation for this year um, on for, in RCA worship, looking at um, how COVID has affected the role of musicians, especially in our churches as we move forward. Um, thank you all, and I'm um, glad you could all be here. Have a very good day. And James, I would like to just thank you for this conversation this time and continue to encourage our churches to be prayerful because we will survive. Yes, we will. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice day.